personal finance practice problem using OneNote. Life insurance calculation tools. Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. You're not required to, but if you have access to OneNote, would like to follow along, we're in the icon on the left-hand side, Practice Problems tab, in the 10131 Life Insurance Calculation Tools tab. Also, take a look at the Immersive Reader tool. The Practice Problems typically in the text area, too, with the same name, same number, but with transcripts. Transcripts that can be translated into multiple languages, either listened to or read in them. Information's on the left-hand side. We're reviewing tools that we might use to calculate how much life insurance we may need. Noting that in prior presentations, we looked at online calculators often offered by insurance companies on their websites. Noting that they ask for different data input, often provided different data output, which is not surprising given the fact that there are many different angles that we can approach the life insurance calculation from. So what we would like to do is gather those tools and look at which ones would be most appropriate for our particular situation and then do our calculation possibly using these online tools as a guide to see if we're kind of in the ballpark. So getting, keeping that in mind, that's what we're doing here. We're basically looking at the kind of tools that we can put together and we'll put some of them together in a more comprehensive problem in future presentations. So the information, we got the wages. So we're gonna say a 60,000. We're gonna say the uh, earnings rate 5%. So if we were to save, in other words, our return, we're going to say it's 5%. Uh, years, we're going to say are 10, and we'll see that shortly. College costs, are we're going to say 40,000. We're going to imagine five kids. We're going to imagine inflation at 3%, and then we'll deal with a mortgage later on in our calculation. So the first thing we're going to think about, and remember the, the main idea you want to keep in mind would be that I can break down the insurance company needs, say for a spouse, for example, into different kind of cash flow needs. The primary one being how much do they need in order to calculate or get by on a year by year basis? How much cash flow do they need and how many years do they need that for? Then we can add on to that other kind of calculations which might act differently in terms of how we would calculate it, for example, uh, one-time costs, such as like an emergency fund maybe, or such as uh, the funeral expenses. And then we might have goal-oriented costs, such as the college tuition, which they don't need every year. So we, we would want to calculate it possibly differently if we're trying to get uh, more precise on it, or say retirement goals, for example, or goals for say a an aged parent or something like that that's gonna need care in the future, medical costs, for example. Those are goal-oriented things and they're gonna, you're gonna have to calculate them a little bit differently. So the first thing we looked at is just kind of a, the, the, the calculation for, for the, the needs on a cash flow basis. The easiest way to do that would be to take, say, the wages, although you don't have to take the wages. You could say that you're gonna take the expenses, for example, and pick, pick uh, that as your starting line number. Then we're gonna need the number of years. Now we talked about a few different ways you could figure the number of years. How many years are they gonna need that cash flow if you were to pass away. Uh, we can calculate that on how many years we have until retirement, how many years they have, the spouse, until retirement, how many years until a kid reaches like 18 or something like that. Now remember, you might be saying, well, after the kid reaches 18, I still have other costs that I might wanna help out with, possibly like college tuition, possibly like retirement, or some those kind of things, which we might tack on on top of them because they behave differently in terms of how we're going to do the calculation so this number or you can use just kind of a heuristic of like seven to ten i have seen as a general kind of rule of thumb calculation now that gave us the insurance needed that would be six hundred thousand. in this case you could keep that number or you might say uh, you could use a heuristic type of number saying well really i'm not going to be around so they're not going to need the full uh, 60,000 if I was to die, for example, because I'm not there. And if they were to get a lump sum at the point of death, they could invest it and earn enough in order to spend enough. So we might use some kind of fraction, for example, 70% in this case, to get to 420,000, 70%. We just use that as a rule of thumb type of number. So now we're at the 420,000. So you could use either the 600 or you know the 420, depending on what you're you know, again, it's not a perfect science. We're just estimating into the future. Estimates are inherently imperfect. But noting that, 
Then another way we might approach this, just note that obviously when you're looking at this 420,000, if they get that in a lump sum, the idea would be maybe they can invest that and say get a return on it. So that would be good. Another way you can look at it is, is it and say, well, how much would I have to get in a lump sum amount in order to get the wages at some point? Meaning it would be nice, it would be great if I can basically put enough, they get enough at the point of my death so that they would get from the earnings the uh, the amount that they would need for however long they need it. That would be a higher, we're going to come up to a higher number, of course, with a calculation like that. But it looks something like this. We could say, okay, the life insurance needs are, are, or this is going to, we're going to back into this number. I'll, I'll do the calculation in reverse here because I would usually say, how much would they need? This would be the unknown 1,200,000. And then we'd have the earnings. We're gonna assume that they earn, we said 5% of on earnings in order to get 60,000. So how much would they need in a lump sum in order to invest it and just live off the investments for however long they need? Obviously it would be a lot more. We're at the 1 million two. So to do that calculation, this times this would be that. So if I was to do my algebra, it'd be the bottom line was known 60,000 divided by 0.05. I'm sorry, let's do that again. It would be the 60,000 divided by 0 0.05. It's gonna be 1,200,000. And then of course you could double check it, taking the 1,200,000 times 0 0.05. That's gonna give us the 60,000. So if we wanted them to be able to just take at the point of death, 1,200,000 and invest it, hopefully earning 5% on it and then earning the 60,000 cash flow and what they would need, they'd never need to touch the 1,200,000 and they hopefully would have the cash flow for however long basically they need it. So obviously that's a much higher number. We can do the algebra and calculate it this way, 60,000 times the 5% would be the 1,200,000. So again, that of course would be a much higher number than the, than the other and so the next thing we might say is well let, let's pick up let's pick up then the idea that they're going to need this sixty thousand each year which again you could say based on your wages or you might do it on a needs basis approach you might be taking for example the expenses uh and then you'd, you'd say well instead of just multiplying it times the 10 years maybe i use a present value uh calculation to think about the lump sum that they would need in order to receive the 60,000. So one way we can do that, we'll first look at it just looking at the earnings. Assume they earn 5%. We're not gonna take into consideration the inflation right now. We're just gonna take that 5% and see how much they would need in order to be able to pull out from like an annuity standpoint, 60,000 each year. So that would be a negative present value. The rate we're gonna say is gonna be that 5% the number of periods and I'm going to do this fast in terms of interpreting this present value because we'll do it in Excel. So if you want to work it in Excel, great tool to use in Excel. And then the number of periods, the number of periods we said is going to be 10. And then we're going to say that it's going to be the payment because it is an annuity would be that 60,000 there. And that's going to give us the 463,304. So you can see that's kind of in between the 600 and the and the 420 we did with like the heuristic just 70 percent approach up top so to prove that we'll prove it you know we'll think about it a couple different ways uh one we could say well what if we think about let me double check this in terms of the earnings uh we could say okay let's take the 463 304 and then if they were to earn 5% on it, we could say, all right, 463, 304 times 0.05, that would be 23, 165 about, and then they're gonna take out each year 60,000. So now they're getting, they got the 463, 304 plus the 23, 165 minus the 60,000. That gives us the 426, 469. If they took out 60,000 each year, we're gonna say, okay, now next time they're gonna earn this times 0 0.05, another 21,323 on average. The earnings, of course, are not perfect. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but that's going to be it. And so we're going to say there's that. And so if I say then we were at the 426, 469, and they earned 21,323 minus the 60,000, that will give us the 387,793. And we can repeat that down the process and we can say okay that's how much we would need we kind of proved to ourselves in essence 
that's how much might be needed in order for them to be able to pull out the 60,000 you know each year instead of just taking the 60,000 times 10 which would be 600,000 because they can invest it now you can calculate that you know a uh, uh, different ways here so you might take say the present value like i could calculate the present value uh you know the same way i did here for nine period for 10 periods at zero and then calculate you know the present value for nine periods and eight periods for example and so that's another way that you can kind of do this calculation and this is going to be useful or could be useful because you might be saying hey look as i get closer to this 10 years which could be like when the child reaches 18 or it could be say when i get to retirement or when my spouse gets to retirement then they're not going to need as much of this cash flow right because you only need it up until that end point so you could try to think about your term life insurance which could decline over time it could the, the amount could decrease as you get closer to retirement or whatever that goal is your kid reaching 18 and again this doesn't need to be the only component of your calculation because you might add on to it other components like goals oriented things such as tuition and so on but uh but you know you could take into consideration the time value of money possibly get in a term life insurance that goes down over time and so that's the idea of having this this break out on a per year basis as opposed to kind of this generic calculation which is really only static it only really makes sense for that one point in time as you get older hopefully as you you know go over the hump of people being dependent and, and being more in debt possibly due to mortgages and whatnot then you would think that you would need less life insurance at some point because you're hoping that you're making other people not dependent upon you but independent from you as as you get older and you would need left life insurance at that time possibly so then let's now now this is not quite perfect because if you're saying this is the 60,000 that they need then they might need due to inflation more than 60,000 as you know inflation goes up so we could try to take that into consideration so now let's do that for our next tool we're going to imagine they're going to get a return of five percent but we're imagining inflation is like three percent now, 3%, where do you get that number? 5%, we're averaging a, 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 a reasonable rate of return. And 3%, uh, the Federal Reserve shoots for inflation to be between like 1% and 3%. So if they're doing their job properly, it should be around there. But it's possible that it could go outside of that. So you could use a, a larger number or something like that. Same with the earnings. Hopefully you get earnings maybe more than 5% or but, or you might want to use a more conservative three, two, you know, 3 or 4% but we're going to use these and then if you use the present value i'm not going to base it on the five percent but rather the real rate of return the two percent because they're going to earn five percent but three percent has been eaten up by the fact that they're going to have to spend more to get the same basket of goods because the value of the dollar is decreasing so present value we're going to take the rate which is now two percent the number of periods will still be 10 and the payment will still be the sixty thousand. so now we get the 538,955 instead of this one, 463,304, because we were basing this one on them being able to earn 5%, not taking into account uh, the inflation. So now this one gets a little bit more complicated to prove. So we'll prove it, based, basically just prove the present value calculation works, and then we'll try to explain it in a little bit more detail in terms of what's actually happening. So you could say, so in other words, this calculation is really only correct for that period zero if we want a declining balance calculation like we did before we're gonna have to get a little bit you know we'll have to think about that a little bit more detail so let me let's do this first so we're gonna say there's the 538,955, and now let's imagine we multiply that times we're gonna say they got the 538,955 times the 0.05 so that's gonna give us then hold on a second is that what the earnings were? Yeah, the 0 0.05. Yeah, but I'm hold on a second. I'm doing it times the 538955 times the, the real rate, 0 0.02. So there's the 10779. They're going to pull out 60,000. So that means that we've got the 538955 plus the 10779 minus the 60,000. And so we got that process. And again, we do that all the way down. So this would be the earnings minus the 60,000. Now, the reality of the situation is 
The earnings we're expecting in terms of actual dollars, we're expecting the earnings to be 5%. And then the payments, we're actually expecting them to not pull out 60,000, but more than 60,000 as time passes because they're gonna need more money to pay for the same stuff. So it's gonna look more like this one over here. So this one kind of proves the calculation, which is correct as of period zero, because if I was to do this all the way down, it would get down to zero. But closer to what's actually happening is in terms of the actual values of dollar value and the future value of dollars, we're expecting that when they start off with this 538,955, we're gonna multiply that times 0.05, and that's gonna give us actually 26,948. And then they're gonna take out not 60,000 a year later, because to buy the same basket of goods, that 60,000 is gonna have inflation, which is 60,000, we said times 0.03. So 18,000 more plus the 60,000, there's the 61,000. So now in terms of future value dollars, they should have 538955 plus 26948 minus 61800. And that would give us the 504103 in terms of future value dollars. So notice it's kind of different than over here because this one's really only correct as of period zero. And so then we're gonna say, okay, so now we've got the 504, 504, 103 and then times the 0.05 they're gonna earn, there's the 25,205, but then the 60,000 is gonna have to go up again because they're gonna need more money to take out in order to buy the same stuff. So 61,800 times 0.03 is another 1,854 plus the 61,800. So now we're at 63,654. So now if I take this 504,103 plus 25,205, minus the 63,654, we're at the 465,654. And if I do that all the way down, we're not exactly zero because of the way we had to kind of, we broke this out on a year by year basis, but you get an idea in terms of real dollars of what's happening. So you could, you could kind of base this outer column as that declining balance calculation instead of this one, because this one's only correct as a point one, if you want like a declining term balance uh, kind of calculation. Or, you know, you could recalculate this. I didn't make an example of it, but you can use this. You can use this calculation up top for for each period. So it was ten periods, and then nine periods, then eight periods, kind of like we did up here. And so then you can get that declining amount, how much is needed. In other words, as you get closer to that endpoint, which possibly could be when the child gets to 18, when you reach retirement, when your spouse reach retirement, whatever that end goal is, and you might be able to tailor your term insurance to decline as you get closer to that goal, which could make it more affordable. Okay, so then you might have like college costs, which you could tack on to this. So that's a goal oriented thing. So if you're trying to calculate a college cost, you, you might do something like, okay, well, the current cost, let's say it's 40,000. I'm just making the number up 40,000 years until college. How long do you have to be until you got to pay for that 40,000? Let's say that uh, they're 18 is when they're going to start college when they're 18. Let's say it might be, a, you know, whatever. We'll set, well, you're going to two years of the city college. If, they, if you're going at all, I don't know, <laughs> 18 minus five. And that's going to give us, uh, the, say the kid's age is five. So we got 13 years before they start college. Now you might try to say, okay, well, the college, you could get more complex and say, well, the college is going to last four years, let's say, and you could do an annuity of how much they need each of those four years. But let's just say as of a lump sum, we need when they're starting college, that much money. And, and so that's going to be the goal that we want. So we've got uh, 40,000 and we've got the 13 years. So we could have the future value. Uh, what what will be the future value dollars that will be needed. So we're doing a future value calculation here because the 40,000 is in uh, current terms, but the actual goal we want to get to is gonna be the 58,741 because we're doing, we're gonna say how much is it gonna cost 13 years later, given the fact that we have the 3% inflation. So this would be a future value calculation, 3% inflation, 13 years into the future, we're going to need 58741 to pay for the college as of the start of the college, we'll say. So now we can think about, okay, well, how much, if they got a lump sum at the point of death, how much would they need 
if they can invest it and get 5% return in order to re reach the future value of the 58741. Uh, so we could say like if I died today and it takes 13 years, then notice we calculated this number based on inflation to get the future value based on inflation, based on the increase of the cost of the college. But here uh, we're gonna take, we're gonna say, let's take the present value of that 58,741 uh, 58, based on the 5%, the earnings, because I'm, I'm assuming we can earn 5%. So we'll take the, the present value of that one lump sum. So notice I have the rate, which is gonna be the 5% in essence. It's a complicated looking formula because we try to make it in Excel so I can copy it down. I won't go into that now. If you wanna do it in Excel, then that's then check it out. We got the number of periods, which we're gonna say is 13 and then two commas because we want the future value. It's not an annuity. And so that's gonna be the uh, 58, 58741. So we would need then, if I died now, 31,153. But what if I died a year later, right? So that's a static number. So as this is one that goes opposite to what we did before, which means that the life insurance would go down. If we have a goal-oriented item, as we get closer to the goal, they're gonna need more in order because they got less time for them to save up, you know, and get earnings on it. So a year later, now, we would have the present value of the rate, which I'm gonna assume a 5% earnings. The number of periods is now 13 minus one, right? Because now we've, because now, you know, a, a year has passed. And then we're gonna say that the future value is still the 58,741. So, and again, you could do this all the way down and say, well, as I get closer to that point where college happens, if I died right before they went to college, then they're gonna need the whole 58,741 in order to pay for the college because they can't earn on it. So notice this one's doing like the opposite. This goal oriented items doing the opposite as this one up top. If we were to combine them together, then again, you can figure out kind of like the declining balance. So you got to think about these things separately because they behave differently. And you can try to figure out the big one, which is this one, how much do they need per year? And then think about the goal oriented ones and possibly add that in layering, you know, your needs uh, like that way using those tools. So this calculation here to kind of prove that that 31 here's the 31 uh here's the earnings on the 31 at the five percent so 31 if i took the 31 152 times 0 0.05 you get the 1558 and if i did that all the way down we'd have the 58741 which we said is how much they're going to need so that's kind of the idea Okay, and so this kind of goal oriented thing, you might do this, for example, also with if you want to calculate your spouse's retirement, because that's another goal oriented thing and try to help or pitch in for that. Or if you had like an elderly parent that's going to need medical, uh, medical costs that you think it's going to be a lump sum in the future, same kind of calculation for those kind of things, they behave differently. And then the other one that could be useful is to calculate your amortization table. I won't go through the whole thing because we've seen it in the past. But the loan, the mortgage is obviously one of the big uh, components. So if you calculated your, your amortization table or possibly just got it online, I, I still think it's good to recalculate it in Excel because then you can break it down from a month by month calculation to a, a year by year calculation, which is much more useful. So oftentimes uh, as, part of your, uh, as part of your calculation, you might try to uh, you might try to tie your term insurance to the loan balance. And there's a couple different ways you can do it. You might say, well, you know, as I get older, my, I'll owe less money because I'll be paying off my big debt, which is gonna be the mortgage. So again, you might say that I wanna have my life insurance decrease as basically the, the mortgage balance decreases. And you might try to figure out and, and allow that if you were to die, I'd like them to just be able to pay off the mortgage. That would be great. Or you might try to figure out the cash flows, of course, on a year by year basis, and then and then use that as part of your calculation, not to have the calculation of them paying off uh, the whole thing possibly, but having the cash flow on a year by year basis until the mortgage you know, is paid off in that way. So that you can use the mortgage again, the major debt oftentimes as another calculating tool, possibly starting off with the amortization table, which I'll show you how to build online if you wanna do this in Excel, and then break it into a year by year calculation 
which is often more helpful, especially to see that debt, where the debt would be, the balance would be on a year by year calculation. And then we can use that in various ways to add on to our, our life insurance calculations. So next time we'll take some of these tools and we'll do an example of like a comprehensive problem, how you might kind of compile them together in a life insurance calculation.